Okay, on this year, in this year, April 26th of this year, it will be David Hume's 300th birthday. 300 years old. He will be 300 years old. He was born April 26, 1711. 300 years ago. Wow, time flies back. <laughs> anyway, the thing I was thinking about something is the challenge that he put out there. David Hume's challenge. And that is, the thing is, can we have knowledge beyond what our senses tell us? You know, According to Hume, our knowledge is limited to what our senses tell us. That's the only thing, the only knowledge we can really have. You know, if I think about tomorrow, I, I may think about everything I'm going to do tomorrow. But that's not anything I can actually know. I can think about it. I can imagine. I can have a very clear idea of what all the things I'm going to do. Or even the things I'm going to do 10 minutes from now or 20 minutes from now. I can have a very clear idea. But that's not knowledge. That's just thoughts. You know, we can think about what other people are thinking and what effect that has on us. But we're just thinking about it. Hume sort of got into this thing that, that just always been in my mind. And that's why, in some ways, I'm kind of somewhat picky on my videos. and I'm, I'm picky in some of the things I say. And I don't really get into debates with people because I don't want to. You know, some people think, and I, it's always a funny thing. There are a lot of people who think I should debate. Oh, you should let people debate, and you want to get involved. You know, see, I actually, I want to say something, because I had thought about this the other day. This is going to be a long video where I'm going to just talk a bit random, so this is not going to make sense. <laughs> but hopefully there will be some interesting stuff that I'll say in it, because I don't even know what I'm going to say. But one thing is that when people debate me, when they when I have never accepted an invitation to a debate, I don't consider that debate. I consider that a tax. I consider that an attack. If me and another person agree to debate, and then we debate on something, that's a different story. I just state things because it's just an opinion. It's not a debate of whose ideal is better, and let's have this supremacy, who my ideal is better than yours. No, your ideals. No, it's not that. My ideals are just ideals, and you can judge them any way you want to. You can say, well, Philip says some stuff that's nonsense. Well, whatever. And that's it. I'm not an expert on anything, as far as I know. <laughs> I don't think I'm an expert. I'm not a professional at anything. I'm just a regular guy. I'm just, as one person described me, as a working class person. And that's it. I don't have any professional titles or anything else. I'm just a regular guy. And I have a camera. And I have an opinion. And so I have a lot of things that I think about David Hume about what he said. And I, for years, I have thought about Hume. I remember when I first read his book way back more than 20 years ago. Reading it and re, not really rereading the whole thing, but skimming through it every so often, looking at it, looking at reading many articles about what other people have thought about it, other scholars and people. And I thought about it. And I thought about all the people who he influenced, including Einstein. And I get to thinking, you know, he had a really powerful effect on people. And I think that if I were ever going to write a book, I would like to write a book that has a powerful effect. Now, it's funny that, you know, I think if you went outside and asked at the average person who David Hume was, they probably would look at you funny and they wouldn't even know. I think the average person, just the average anybody, doesn't know who David Hume is. They never even heard of him. But most people who are academic people and people who are into philosophy or science and things like that have heard of him. They've heard of David Hume. And the people who've actually read David Hume and really kind of got into his things, those are even fewer in number. But, you know, if you get into it, it's interesting. Because the challenge he put about knowledge, there are so many people who claim to know things. And they don't. And I tend to agree with Hume's issue that our knowledge is very, very, very limited. It's extremely limited. It's very limited. And I think a lot of people have 
challenged Hume on things. And I think a few people have come up with some really smart ways of looking at Hume. I think I think about William James and I think about Einstein and what he his look on this. You know, our knowledge is limited. Einstein would agree with that. Our knowledge is limited. It is very limited. But, you know, Einstein's statement was imagination is more important than knowledge. Imagination is more important than knowledge because you can go beyond things. See, there's a kind of thing, and I, th I was thinking about this earlier. I was trying to make a video, and I, I thought of something in the middle of that video, which was just, you know, I didn't, I decided not to put up. But I think that we all kind of suffer from an eternal, incurable ignorance. A kind of ignorance that cannot be cured. I mean, we can have knowledge and we can gain some insights into things. But there is a kind of incurable ignorance. An ignorance of really seeing the world from a perspective other than our own. In a real sense. You really can't. You can only imagine a perspective other than your own. You can only imagine, which is the best you can do. You can imagine how other people see things, but sometimes that's enough. That's good enough to imagine the world from somebody else's perspective, to imagine how other people see it, how other people feel. Again, as Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge because I try to imagine how other people see things. And when I make that effort, there is a payoff. You gain certain insights into things by using your imagination. That's one of the things Einstein did. You know, used his imagination to gain insights about the world. And then tested those insights. Tested them. You know, those his, all of his insights have been put to the test by science. You know, when he came up with the theory of relativity over 100 years ago, Well, there's two parts of the theory. There's the special theory and the general theory. One he came up with in 1905 and the other one is 1916. But those things have been put to the test. And they're still testing it, even to this day. So you can gain some insights by thinking and by going, as he, the way he put it, I love the way Einstein said, you know, you go over the materials. You know, you take in things through your senses, you observe things, you look at things, you see things. But then you use reasoning, you analyze that material, you go over it, you carefully go over it. And then you put it to the test. See if these insights and theories work. See if there's a consistency. This is the best that we can do. But to have absolute knowledge... We can never have it. We can only test things, see how it works, see if it stands up to, to, to all the rigors of science. You know, I actually thought about science being this way. That science is kind of like a bank. You know, and the claims that people make are like people who apply for a loan. A bank will look at that loan application. They'll look at that application. You know, I got I to put on my little act and pretend like this is a, a application. Hmm. Okay, let's look at your application. Okay, you say this, that, that. We check it out and see. And if you meet the qualifications, we'll loan you the money. Well, science will give you credit for certain things if everything adds up. You're given credit. Credit. So, in everyday life, we do the same thing, too, even those of us who are not scientists. You know, again, I'm, I'm always quoting Einstein. I'm, I'm meant to talk a lot about Hume, but I'm also going to bring Einstein up because he's like one of these great minds that everybody likes to think about. But um, our knowledge, what we think of as knowledge, is really like credit. It's not really knowledge. And it's like credit, like credit in a real sense. You know, credit is not money. <laughs> I have a credit card. When I don't have any real money, I just use my credit card. <laughs> but you got to pay it back. You see, that's the thing. You might claim something to be true. You present your theory 
a person looks at it, they carefully analyze it, scientists scrutinize it, look at it, compare it to facts that have been tested, and say, wow, this all adds up and it makes sense. So we give it credit. We do more testing and it seems to hold up and hold up and hold up. Okay, we say that this theory is a valid theory. It works in every way. But you know, a theory can hold up for a while. And maybe, as, as William James would say, on average, a theory might last about 400 years. New data comes up and shows that, wait a minute, this theory doesn't work in every case. It doesn't work in all the cases. We need a new theory. So we adjust the theory. Somebody else analyzes the situation more with the new data, and they come up with a new theory that replaces the old one. That always happens in science. Theories change. Old theories are discarded. People might believe certain things, for example, about electricity, how it works, how electricity flows through a wire. There were old theories that, you know, that it flowed like the way water flows through a thing. But now we kind of understand other things about how that little electrons jump. I remember reading all this stuff about how the theories have changed. And as more research is done, even the simplest things, you, you begin to realize things don't work that way. It's, it's interesting. But I'm not going to go into all that. I mean, there are a lot of people who are better at physics stuff and can talk about that than me. But I just think it's interesting. Careful analysis. The best we can do is look at a theory and give it credit. Credit it with something called truth. Say, okay, this one has credibility. It has credits because it seems to match up with everything that we could observe with all the empirical evidence. You know, I was thinking about what uh, Richard Feynman was talking about. You know, how do you form a theory? Well, you can just guess. But in the end, no matter what, no matter how you do it, it still has to stand up to the test. You have to test it and see if it's true or if it matches up or if all the empirical evidence lines up with it. If it doesn't, if there's something that doesn't line up with the things you're saying, then the theory has to be thrown out. It's not giving credit. It's just like an application for a loan. Well, you didn't pay back this bill and you didn't do that and this, that, and the other thing, whatever. Throw out your application. <laughs> Even if a theory is really beautifully written, it could be beautifully written in wonderful mathematical equations and everything else. But if it just doesn't add up, that's it. It's wrong. You put a big X on it. It's like, you know, when you go to school. If, if a teacher gave you a big math equation that had 100 steps to it, you could do 99 of those steps correctly and make a mistake on one part. If it's just one big, long equation with 99 steps, one part being wrong means the whole thing is wrong. And that's how theories are. A theory is like a machine. It's, it's basically a tool. A tool, a mind tool, a mental tool that we use to understand the universe. Equations and principles and things like that to kind of understand things. The the formula for gravity and all that stuff. The, I don't know exactly. I don't remember how in the physics book how that was written. Newton's thing about gravity. Or Einstein's famous E equals M C squared equation, which is actually longer than that, by the way. So you know, if you actually wrote it out the way it was, it's a lot longer than that. That's just a shortened version of it. But um, these are just tools that we use to try to get an insight into the universe. It's like an instrument. It's like it's like a telescope in a way. You use this instrument to look through the, you look through the telescope and you can see something that you couldn't see without it. A theory helps you to see something in reality that you really couldn't see without it. It's a very valuable tool, but just like any tool, it has to stand up to testing. It has to stand up to test. And theories always change. It's just a tool. And its value is, how useful is it? 
if it's useful, we keep it. If we realize it's not really helping us a lot, then we get rid of it. You know, I've I, I said I was going to talk all over the place, so this is, it could be about everything. I want to get back into the, get into something. Maybe into something that's a little bit controversial, and that's about the religious thing. To me, a lot of religious ideals work. They serve me. Now, other people can argue about that and say, oh, well, religious ideals are stupid and silly and nuts and crazy, and they don't work. And that may be true for you. But this is subjective. It's individual things. Different people have different ways. You know. I'm not giving up my religion. Because it works for me. I would give it up, however. If somebody could show me. One, that it doesn't work for me. That it doesn't work for me. And that I really have been deluding myself. And there is a better way to think. If you can show me that, fine. Now, I'm not saying everybody should think the way I do. I'm not saying everybody should look at the world the way I do. You look at the, way, the world the way that works for you. If that works for you, fine. Again, this is not science. What I'm saying now is not science. It's just me. I have a certain way of dealing with things. And I deal with it that way. This is not a debate. I think that it's funny that sometimes when I get people who want to debate me, they feel like everything in the world should be looked at scientifically. That the only way to look at the world is scientifically. And that science is the only way we should ever see anything. And I actually think that's not true. You know, when I'm listening to music, I don't look at it scientifically. <laughs> it's kind of funny, I think, again, going with Einstein quotes. And he was talking about, if you looked at a, at a Beethoven symphony, in a scientific way, you're going to be missing the whole point of everything. <laughs> you know, you can look at science of music. How the vibration of the strings create vibrations in the air is the, you know, and all that sort of thing. You're playing the violin. You know, you could think of it that way, but then you're not really paying attention to the music. You're not getting into that moment. Being very analytical about music, you're missing it. Be, even being analytical about, you know, reading a novel. I could be reading a novel that's totally fictional. But I'm getting into it. I'm getting into the story. Enjoying it. Having fun with it. Feeling the effects that the writer meant for me to have. You know, they wanted me to get into the adventure and the excitement. So I can suspend all this being super scientific and everything has to be realistic. No, everything doesn't have to be realistic. You can suspend that for a moment. Not permanently, but you can temporarily do it. You know, if you're watching a movie, if you're watching Star Wars, you can suspend your disbelief. You know, it's like what they call the willful suspension of disbelief that this is real. <laughs> you know, you can willfully suspend that disbelief for a moment, for two hours, watch a movie, get into it, and have a wonderful experience. And then you come back to reality and say, okay, yeah, that was a fantasy, but it was fun. It's like a dream. You know, last night I had this dream I had a car, you know, which I don't have. But, um, and it was fun. In dreams, you do suspend your disbelief. Somehow you just automatically do it. You don't even have to think about it. Because in that world, it's real. You experience it as real. And I like to read fantasy things. I like to read fiction. I love to, you know, look at all kind of things. That are, you know, and I'm a big movie person. I, I love movies. I love poetry. It's just funny when you think about people who have to see everything rational and scientific. And it's got to be science and it's got to be this. And they forget that the whole point of all these other things is to have the experience. Get into the music. Experience the soothing music of Bach. Experience the exciting fantasy of the movie. Or the beautiful imagery of the poems. Can you do all that stuff and be extremely science and serious and... Ah, ah, you know, don't be so serious. It's like, that's why I always think when people get 
too serious about everything I'm saying. It it just it creates like this ugh, like calm down, relax. Take a chill pill. You know, just take it easy. You don't have to be that serious about things. But that's all I have to say. Because I'm just going on and on and on and on and just rambling on. I just wanted to make a long video <laughs> to talk about different things. And hopefully, you know, I guess somebody might learn something about me from that. Maybe.